Hello and welcome to Myth Talks presented in partnership with the University of Melbourne. My name is Natasha Mitchell. I'm a science journalist and radio presenter and podcaster and this session is happening on the land of the people of the Kulin Nations who have been doing science for many millennia before this moment. May science today work on being better informed by Indigenous scientists and students and leaders. 50 years ago in 1969, the first all-woman scientific expedition landed in Antarctica. They wanted to collect their own samples and before then they'd never been allowed to. But here's the thing, when those women touched down on the beautiful continent of Antarctica, the first question they were asked was whether they'd brought lipstick. Yes. Well, half a century later, The Leadership is a fantastic documentary screening at this year's Melbourne International Film Festival. It's directed by Illy Barre. It follows 76 women in science today on a really unusual 20-day mission to Antarctica. And what unfolds is so fascinating. They are not there to collect samples. They are there to collect courage, to share war stories, to face their demons, to help them become leaders in professions that often have held women back or locked them out because of a sexist system and culture. And what unfolds in the film is so fascinating. It's ambitious. Uh, It's an emotional journey. It's full of really interesting tense moments. And I'm pleased to say to talk about the film and also about their careers and perhaps even revolution. I'm joined by three of the film's stars today. Dr. Samantha Grover is all about soil and the good things it can do with, uh, for us and how it can be used to address climate change and food security locally and globally. She heads up the Soil Atmosphere Anthropophysics Poposphere, I I can actually say that word, Uh, lab at RMIT University and works on projects in Indonesia and elsewhere too. Fern Hames is with the Arthur Ryla Institute for Environmental Research with the Victorian Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning where she runs what's called the Victorians Value Nature Programme working alongside citizen scientists and fishers and frogs and birds and other critters to help us really connect with nature. She's had this wild and varied career and she's also part of the Homeward Bound program which runs these leadership missions to Antarctica. Joining us from Beijing is Song Chao Yao. She is an explorer and educator and founder of Wild Bound which collaborates with climate leaders and scientists and artists and runs extraordinary expeditions to places like Antarctica and Greenland and Nepal and Bhutan and Tibet and many more places, all with a focus on sustainability and solving the big ecological challenges, but particularly on reconnecting young people to nature in China and globally. Hey, welcome you three. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Natasha. It's a pleasure, Natasha. Here. Thanks for having us. Great to be here. Now, look, women scientists aren't normally uh, on the big screen at an international film festival. So (laughs) from all of you, how does it feel having this moment in the spotlight? Fern? Oh, seriously weird. (laughs) Yes, that's not something that scientists generally do. Uh, And if they do, probably in a quite different kind of context from this one. And, And this one, you know, we're not, although we're there as scientists, we're there exploring leadership, which is a different thing. And and I love the way this film is so complex and complicated in, in that. You know, it um it, yes, it's about scientists, yes, it's about leadership, yes, it's about Antarctica, it's about so many things. And for me it's a bit like a um it's like Antarctica itself, in that it's it's full of stories that are complicated and a bit messy and it's full of nature and science and politics and history and stories and perception but most of all as you mentioned it's full of people of courage and I think that's great yeah yeah you've summed it up so beautifully Um, Sam what about you how does it feel to be in the spotlight 
I think before I went on Homeward Bound, I would have had quite a different answer. But today, four years later, it feels quite natural. It feels fine. The part of the program that was about visibility was not on my radar. It wasn't of interest to me. I didn't go um, or, or apply to be part of the Homeward Bound program for that component of it. But I really learnt about the importance of women scientists being visible. It's been so valuable to me to see and interact with people like Fern and some of the other senior women scientists because I haven't had role models of women in science. Um, And so if I can do that, if I can be a scientist that in people's imagination um, by being on the big screen, which is kind of weird in COVID, like small screen, big screen. <laughs> um, but yeah, if uh, younger women scientists and also, you know, aspiring women scientists who might be still at high school can see women scientists on the big screen through this, then yeah, I think that's a really great thing to be part of. Because that's so much a part of this story about women in science, isn't it? You cannot be what you cannot see. Yeah, yeah. And I guess I had heard that uh, before I got involved with Homeward Bound, but I hadn't really, I don't know, I hadn't really given it too much thought. Um, Mm. Song Chow, how about you? Because as we'll hear in the course of our conversation today, your life has taken such an interesting turn since this project, but what does it feel like to star on the big screen? I I feel like I've always been um, in an odd place or the odd person in a place where people don't look like me. Um, And I think like talking about science at a film festival also feels kind of like that. But I also embrace this world, which we actually have more diversity and people interacting with each other and we're embracing multiple identities. So um, I, I I saw the film first initially with another Chinese friend and she was like, you're really the only Asian face. And I think I didn't really recognize that until uh, looking at the, just watching the film uh, as a third person, almost as an observer's angle, because when you're on the ship, you're very much in part of the story. Um, so I think it's really interesting after a few years having this, um, another perspective and I think also having this opportunity to um, talk to our friends and also to share this audience of people who might be interested in science but who are more interested in the story and film and I think that's where uh, sparkles and interesting things can happen when these different worlds collide. Yeah and so many Asian women take up the sciences so we want to see those women move on into leadership role roles as well that are visible uh across the world (laughs) fern the trip in this film was imagined into being by fabian datner who is this larger than life character a a well-known australian ceo a corporate leadership kind of guru. She's a rough and tough talker. Uh, She's an extraordinary presence in the film. Why did she think women in science needed her leadership input? What's at the the heart of this? She talks about um, the mantra that she uses is that mother mother nature needs her daughters. But what, what is driving her to send over 70 women off to Antarctica? Well, you've probably seen the story where Fabian met with some senior women in Tasmania who were working in leadership in Antarctic science. And jokingly, one of them made a comment that the only way to really progress in leadership in Antarctic science was if you had a beard. And (laughs) although it was sort of said as a bit of a joke, it also wasn't really. And Fabian really took that to heart and she really thought about that and, you know, went home and literally had this dream of taking a whole lot of women to Antarctica and building their will and skills in matters that affect the planet and leadership. 
And she took that back to those women and said, I've got this idea. What do you think? Is this going to work? Because Fabian had been working on leadership with other groups of people for a long time. And she could see the opportunity to connect her leadership training background and the work that she does in this particular context in a way that is so important for today. Because, you know, today the, the world is so complicated and complex. We have so many wicked problems that are out there right now, right across the globe. And the only way we're really going to resolve those is when we bring the best minds to those issues and when we have multiple perspectives looking at those issues. And, you know, Fabian's really well aware that it's a bit like if you're a person who has two legs and you're trying to run on just one of them, that you're not exploring the full human potential that you have. You're not bringing the most effective solutions that you have. You're not really doing a great job. So she recognised that bringing women into this realm of science, bringing science into the decision making on all these really important wicked problems that are affecting the planet, was the way to progress not only the opportunities in leadership for women, but to address the issues across the globe that are that are wicked and affecting all of us. So she brought those ideas together. Um, thankfully, those women said, yes, it's a good idea. Let's go with it. And, you know, Fabian's one of the few people who, who can do that. Like lots of us would have a dream and go, oh, you know, imagine taking a bunch of women to Antarctica and doing a leadership program for three weeks. Yeah, yeah, great idea. Um, you know, what's my first meeting today? And, yeah. and we wouldn't really progress <laughs> that idea. But Fabian goes, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> and yeah, she the makes ultimate can do person, happen. isn't she? Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that I've really learned from Fabian is that whole thing around team. You know, we each bring really different things to, for example, the, the Homeward Bound Leadership Faculty. Fabian's the one with the big ideas saying, yes, let's do this. And there's some of us going, let's plan it. <laughs> and everyone's bringing different things to making Homeward Bound a success. <laughs> so, yeah, um, but that's, that's how it started. I'm interested in where you were all at and and kind of your motivation for why you put your hand up for what really actually turns out to be, as the film reveals, a pretty wild experiment. Uh, Song Chow, I know that you'd always wanted to go to Antarctica. This had been a sort of childhood connection for you, hadn't it? Yeah, um, I've uh, received a set of photos when I was only nine years old from a family friend, and I could, didn't have access to documentaries that kids today would have. So they wouldn't already know so much about our planet. But the only access to Antarctica were these photos of emperor penguins, of sea ice and seals. So I've always had a childhood dream and wanting to go. So Antarctica is kind of this special place, and I would like to grab every opportunity I can get. Um, back then in 20. 16. I saw Homeware Bound. My friends recommended it to me. I like think I think I read a New York Times article and I just thought, why don't I email the founder and give it a try? I, I know that people have been planning for this for a long time, but I thought um, this is exactly what I was looking for because there were other expeditions to Antarctica. Um, some of them were also focused on not only science or not tourism, but having an environmental mission. But having a female expedition and exploring leadership, I just imagine all the people I'm going to meet and all the role models that I would, I, I would meet on this journey. Me, just exactly like what Sam has said. Um, so that's what got me there. I just finished um, business school and it was really interesting because a lot of my colleagues were going on for these like really well-off jobs and I was going to Antarctica volunteering and joining this expedition which I really wouldn't be able to expect what could happen there. And along the journey, a lot of things happened because I was trying to get sponsorship for us and I was uh, trying to get communications work. Um, and I actually met Sam at the airport uh, going to Ushuaia and, you know, with boxes of T-shirts and water bottles that we gathered <laughs> for for the, the women on the, on the ship. And I, I was actually at one point held at Argentinian Customs because they, they wouldn't let me go 
with all of these sponsored goods. And I said, but they are for scientists and it's an international expedition. How could Argentinian customs not, not allow this to happen? So yeah, it was just like, I think really marvelous before even the voyage starts and um, was very excited. <laughs> But Songxia, yeah. you've never taken the path that your parents might have expected for you. I mean, you went to Cambridge and Oxford and you did all that, but you've you've really something really early on galvanized you to become an activist around climate change and young people. What what was that trigger for you? I think um, I was very lucky to kind of grow up in a time and era when China was really opening up and a lot of new things are happening. And I think my parents, although they weren't sure what they want me to do, they wanted me to embrace and um, just try different things. And then later when I studied abroad, I realized I've always cared so much about the environment and I cared so much uh, when I was a child. But during my school years, because things are so um, hard and you know uh, the students have not so much free time they're not really allowed to explore so much their own passion because you have to go through the systems to get to a good college and a lot of those desires and the passion I had for for, for mother a nature for the planet I have to ignore them and get on with my studies so um, in college and when I studied abroad and realized the issue has only gotten worse since when I was a child and then there's this sense of urgency that I couldn't just like really work for a big company or for a polluting industry. I have to devote what I have um, back to what nature has provided for us. So that was kind of the first um, thing I could take. Also as a young and passionate person, you know, fresh graduates, like you would uh, want to put all your heart and soul into something that could make a difference. Um, yes. I think I've become I mean, more rational, uh, <laughs> but I think <laughs> at first it was really this this younger passion. It's it's interesting, but you sort of there describe the trajectory of getting to know yourself and letting yourself become your true self um, better. And in some ways, this is what this trip was about. It, it was asking all over seventy of you to cleave open your soul, and what is revealed as an incredibly emotional uh, journey for you all. Sam, where were you at when you responded to Fabian's call that Mother Nature needs her daughters? I mean, that would make some scientists slightly grimace. But where were things at for you? You'd become a parent, you were carving out your scientific career, but that was with all sorts of interesting systemic challenges, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so I guess I heard about Homeward Bound through, well, I got, a, I got an email from a very supportive, uh, same age as me, but very supportive boss. Um, so I was in my, oh, I can't remember now, maybe fourth postdoctoral position, so short-term research contracts, and I had had my second son. And each, I guess, each position I had had a different situation where I could try and negotiate so that I could work part-time and, you know, look after my children. And I really felt incredibly lucky to have managed to hang on in science, though choosing, despite choosing to have children, because I, you know, since having, since finishing my PhD, lots of my friends and colleagues had just dropped off because it's, well... You don't see any jobs advertised part time, um, although that is starting to change now. But this I'd is always... a really fundamental issue, though, for women in science in particular. Somehow, men who become fathers in science are not having their careers truncated in the same way that women who become parents in science are. Yeah, and look, it's a hard. It's I guess in any parent. Oh, many parents, fathers and mothers and non-birth mothers would be torn between going back to work full time and being a more um, engaged parent, particularly when their child is really, really small. Um, so, yeah, everyone's in, in different situation there. Um, 
but I felt really lucky that I had been able to stay employed as a scientist, but was feeling kind of frustrated um, that I was still at these entry level positions, very junior positions, really being actively told not to take on, um, you know, more, um, how shall I say it, like leadership roles within my professional organization because I had family commitments and I had work. So I couldn't take on those. I was advised that it wouldn't be a good idea to take on those additional things. Um, so I was kind of struggling with that. So when I saw this, um, yeah, this program, and it was sent to me by Clayton, who was my supervisor at that time, um, I thought, well, you know, maybe maybe this is an opportunity. It's outside of work, but it's kind of work related that I could learn some some tactics, some skills, some ways to progress my career. Because I had felt, I guess, yeah, I mean, in grade two, I was the captain of the netball team. In high school, I set up the environment committee. I I wanted to take more of a leadership role, but yeah, in my late 30s with two children as a part-time researcher, that wasn't available to me professionally at all. Yeah, interesting. Fern, you had had a great desire early on in your incredibly wild and varied career, uh, a desire to go to Antarctica. You had been studying Antarctic algae, algae and you'd wanted to go to work on the samples. What, what had happened back then early on as a young scientist to you? Well, unlike Song Chow, I hadn't really connected with Antarctica when I was a little child. But at university, I came to know about Antarctic algae through initially an, an honours project um, and studying samples that my supervisor had brought back, as were all of us in the lab, really. But um, over the course of continuing to study about Antarctic algae, I became really obsessed actually about Antarctic algae, Antarctic mosses. Soil is pretty good, Sam. <laughs> Soil is awesome. Soil is awesome. There's a great and, point um, in the film where Sam sees moss in Antarctica and, and just that you kind of drop to your knees and, and there's the moss. But we'll come back to that. Fern. Well, I, I had the same moment really because, you know, al although I was obsessed about um, algae and mosses, this, this was the early 80s in Australia and I applied for um, some field jobs down there and I got really good feedback in response to those, but I was told, sorry, we can't actually accept your application though because we don't have facilities for women, which really surprised me because it was the first time I'd encountered anything like that. And I tried two, maybe three times, thinking this can't be right, I'm going to keep trying, it'll change. <laughs> but it didn't change and it just seemed too hard. So I literally sort of put that passion away in the back of my mind, but remained obsessed in a way, and you can't see it, but behind me there's a bookshelf that has about 80 books about Antarctica on it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, I just absorbed Antarctica in every way, but went on to do other things, became involved in fish research and did other things. And then, and I also became really interested in leadership. I did a tremendous program with the Australian Rural Leadership Foundation. They run an Australian Rural Leadership Program, which is remarkable and wonderful. And I'd really enjoyed that. It had made me really interested in leadership and how I could apply that in multiple ways. And I was interested in gender equity issues that I was seeing in the workplace and life and globally. So when I saw Homeward Bound advertised, it seemed a remarkable triumvirate for me. It was like it brought together these three things that I was deeply passionate about, Antarctica, gender equity and leadership. And I literally could not quite believe it. It felt like it was written for me. And I had massive imposter syndrome, though. I thought, there's no way I'll get in. There's no way I will get in. But I'm going to give it a try because I, would, I couldn't not try. <laughs> So I had expectations but massive hope and couldn't quite believe it when I did get in. 
And when I finally went there, and it was actually the same place, Carli at Carlini Research Station, when I actually saw moss and algae, I fell to my knees. <laughs> and it's giving me goosebumps now just remembering it because it was so exciting to actually be in Antarctica and see the way in which algae and moss were growing there. And at the same time, to be aware of the retreating glacier right there, the nun attack that was now exposed because of the glacier retreating, and to see the fragility and vulnerability of this extraordinary place. So it, it was, um, yeah, bittersweet. It was no accident that, no accident was it that Homeward Bound had taken you to Antarctica because it is both this incredibly resilient but incredibly vulnerable landmass and it's kind of ground zero of the conversation we need to have about climate change. Um, I just want to though go back and I'm, I'm going to come back to this imposter syndrome business because I think that's a very interesting conversation to have um, for a group of women who are connected to the sciences and to questions around leadership. But just to go back to that experience of being told as a young woman well, I'm sorry, we don't have the facilities for you to go to Antarctica um, or at, at Antarctica. What what did that early barrier do to you, your state of mind? I mean, you didn't go on to become an Antarctic scientist and yet you've got a bookshelf of 80 books <laughs> on Antarctica. But just climb inside that early encounter. Well, for me, it wasn't the first barrier like that. So, I mean, I'm a bit older than Song Chao and Sam, and I guess I, you know, started a scientific career when things were more difficult. And I had, um, I did encounter some other difficulties uh, earlier, even in undergraduate um, study. So when the whole Antarctic thing happened, it was sort of, oh, here we go again this barrier that I hadn't ever really expected. Because when I grew up, like my, my dad was a mathematician, a statistician, and we used to just talk maths and chaos theory all the time. So it never occurred to me that you couldn't do whatever you like in science. So when I began to hit these barriers, it was quite a shock to me. And then when I went and did the fish research, I also encountered some more barriers. So it was, I, I, I ended up being a bit like the reed or like the meandering river where every time I hit a barrier, I'd just go another place. <laughs> and I just kept doing that. But then Homeward Bound made me reflect a bit on those barriers and realise that there are opportunities for us to work at those barriers. And of course, things have changed a lot. Things are a lot better these days. There are still things that persist. There are still things that we need to work on. And Homeward Bound does help give us the will and the skills to do that and support other women. Yes, things have changed. But what is revealed in the leadership, this documentary screening it at uh, the International Film Festival, Melbourne International Film Festival this year, it reveals that, that women still encounter uh, unacceptable levels of sexual harassment, of sexual assault, there are extraordinary stats in the film. Um, and then what becomes apparent is that people on board start sharing their stories. Um, and it becomes an incredibly emotional journey for for all of you, I think. And Fern, I just will come back to you because you do share a story in the film of an early field trip as a young scientist. Just share that briefly for us now to give us a sense of what you and others continue to experience today? So I think you're probably talking about the conversation I had with Lauren about her work in the mining industry. And she'd been talking about an incident where she and a colleague had had their drinks spiked, which was pretty challenging. Their drinks so spiked. In, mm. hmm. So um, that, you know, reminded me of things that I'd experienced similarly and I was working at a semi-remote research station where I was the only woman there and one of the men there um, took a, a shotgun to the little hut that I was living on 
on site and, you know, shot through the whole room. And, um, and I wasn't, although I was shocked that that happened, <laughs> unsurprisingly, I guess, <laughs> I was more surprised that nothing really happened. You know, if I think that happened today, there would be quite a response and I would feel really supported. But at the time that that happened in the mid 80s, um, it was, you know, don't make a fuss. Oh, we've, we've had a chat to him. I don't think he'll do it again. Um, OK, you know, what, what's next for today? So yeah. it, it was really diminished and uh, I, I would have, um, you know, I certainly didn't talk about it anymore or go any further with it. And it, and although um, I was talking about it with Lauren, it has, and I've, you've just asked me to repeat it again here, it's not something that I dwell on or is that a, you know, a big no. thing in my background. It's just, there's a whole lot of stories like that. All women have these a shocking stories moment. like that. Yeah. Yes, and Anne absolutely. in the movie. All women have these stories and that's just one that I happen to share and we have lots of them and we just learn to deal with them and we're trying to build a more collegiate um, atmosphere with our colleagues now so that uh, we have a different way of working together. Well, I think the issue is that, that often for women in science, we keep, we bottle those stories up and we push them aside because we've got to kind of get on the business of, of thriving and surviving and pushing forward with our passionate careers. Um, and there's a really interesting premise at the heart of this film <clears throat> that perhaps women lead differently. I mean, Fabian describes it like this. She says, there are some mission critical differences when women are leading at their best that our world really needs right now. And, you know, my experience, certainly when I was studying engineering, was that there was a prevailing belief or feeling amongst women that we needed to be one of the boys. You know, I didn't have this feeling, but this was something I encountered a lot, that we needed to kind of <clears throat> not not make ourselves be different, really, not stand out too much. Um, we are just as capable and just as good as the men doing engineering. So I'm interested in your reflections on this question of whether women do leadership differently. Song Chow, what, what's your thought about this, about Fabian's sort of attempt to push women forward into leadership because she thinks women are distinct? I think um, I now have a different answer uh, from when I was on the journey. And over the years, actually since Homeward Bound, I have started my own organization and I've actually worked with remarkable women leaders. And I think, you know, a lot of things that happened on the Homeward Bound journey and uh, just particular um, ways that women lead, I'm, I'm finding the dots are actually connecting because um, I find it's often, um, you know, when we talk about leadership, you don't question what kind of leadership you're thinking about, but you automatically think about a male dominated leadership model, which is usually one person at the top. And it's usually, um, you know, uh, there's leaders and followers. And I think women lead in a more diverse way. And usually um, there's more connection, there's more communication. It's not always uh, smooth and like very direct direct or super results oriented is usually this meandering river like what Fern has mentioned and sometimes you know it has its messiness it has its richness um, it has emotions and but there is a sense that it's more it, it's more about the people it's more about the, the next generation and there's usually a, more of a long-term mindset so I think even the leadership as a movie that's exploring leadership is so different from um, a documentary on Steve Jobs or, you know, any other leader that we like world leaders right now who are either political or business or scientific, you know, it's, it's just like a very different from what you would expect the stereotypical leadership film or books, because um, there's more authenticity and richness in this messiness, um, which is like nature itself, right? Like river, like soil, and it ha just has all of its complexities. And I think um, me growing 
growing in the past four years, I'm just like able to embrace all of it in a much more open way because I think I was less able to look at the emotional side, the negative emotions and these barriers that we face in society or maybe not being able to talk about it. But now realizing all of them are actually nourishment for a person's growth. And as, as a society, we have to face these issues and these prejudices and these injustices to actually grow and flourish better. Oh, um, gee, I find that so interesting because yeah. we're often... Some child, that was so of, beautiful. <laughs> Yeah, isn't it? I, I, we're often told to kind of contain our emotions, though, aren't we? You know, don't show emotion. It's what women do and don't show emotion. But emotion is everything. <laughs> but I, I wonder, though, Song Chao, why you think women lead in that different way? I mean, I'm, I'm aware of, of making generalisations, but do you think it's about the way we are socialised? Um, the expectations that we have of us um, or put upon us from an early age to think of ourselves in relation to others. Uh, I think perhaps women experience that more than men. Girls more than boys. I, I think it, it's hard to generalize or say, you know, how how much of it is is just women, or how much of that is socialized, and how much is, um, you know, socially conditioned and different culture. Also, I think have different expectation of women, and what kind of role models we have in society. But I I do think that women very often hold community together, and I think this is um this is true almost across culture that you're um, not. Not only setting the goals, but you're also actually holding the team together. You're usually um, gathering uh, different generations. You're taking care of the elder and the younger and the children. Um, and very much, we need women to kind of carry on and to be to maintain these relationships. And women also have a natural way to feel connected to other women. And it, I think it's a major way that we actually reflect and process and learn together as a community. Um, which is really interesting when Fern talked about imposter syndrome and I think like across the board men and men women will feel that and it's a very isolating feeling right like feeling that you have faked it but women have the opportunity or Homeward Bound actually created the community um, for us to share this because it's it's this paradox and it's isolating but it's also universal and I think you know this is really fundamental to every human being but I think women actually have advantage to open up this conversation about courage about uh, shame about vulnerability and I think it's very much what we actually need in the past maybe a hundred years we have been just going economic growth and development there's all of these external goals to achieve but like look at what that had done for our environment and for, for our world and I think movements like Me Too and these decentralized movements are kind of also uh, within the realm of a female-based model, which is uh, more organic, more generative, and can connect different um, people together. So I think that's really powerful, and that is what we need. And unfortunately, there's not a straight answer or very clear outcome and you know it's not so clear as written in a spreadsheet and we have to figure it out but it it, it also allows us to claim agency um so i think it's uh, it's definitely not easy it's it's difficult for women but as with anyone else but we can perhaps start these conversations and start these movements sam i could really see you responding to what song chao was saying and this whole journey that's uh, explored in this film is an emotional one um, but it kind of it asked so much of you it asked you to sort of almost cleave open your soul and for you that had a really dramatic change I mean it really has provoked a really dramatic change in your life in a kind of in so many ways tell me about this absolutely and you know, so Fabian promised a transformative experience in Antarctica. And I think, you know, I I kind of took that not very literally. I thought, you know, that we were going to have an amazing experience. But, and I know everyone had a different experience, but for me, I really 
did have a completely transformative experience. The combination of learning that we did around um, emotional intelligence, different learning styles, how people learn, and then the I still don't have a good um, way to explain what the lifestyles indicator work that we did was about, <laughs> but about how um, how we have developed certain behaviours over time and how we then um, apply those behaviours and how we think about how we are um, was just a transformative combination for me. And I guess it was a time um, and a place where that was, re- I was really ready for that. And yeah, I mean, so, so what, Antarctica what is an inspiring place to learn. Uh, what motivations did I have? So well, I had what, what always had a what passion for the environment. What realisations did you have while you were there? What changed? Um, just one. <laughs> what realisations did I have? I had so many realisations. Um, I guess about how, let me try and think of an example. Um, well, it changed your, it, it, I mean, you've said to me that it changed your parenting, it changed your whole perfectionist way of being in the world. That's a great example. Thanks, Natasha. Um, so one of the things that I think many of the people on the ship and many scientists could um relate to is having a bit of a perfectionist tendency. So you don't generally get to be a successful scientist if you haven't been really focused on studying and doing the right thing and getting all the answers right um, to get through high school and into university. And um, so not, not everyone, but lots of people in science have that kind of perfectionist tendencies. And what I guess two things about that really um, have changed the way that I operate. One is to recognise that I am a perfectionist and that's been useful. And the other is to recognise that that's not always useful and I don't have to stay in that mindset. I have a tendency to want to be a perfectionist, but through the both emotional and behavioural work that we did on Homeward Bound and that I'm actually continuing to do. So I'm doing some follow-up training with the um, with Fabian's group here, here in Melbourne, well, online. Um, yeah, I, I don't have to be a perfectionist about everything. I don't have to be a perfectionist where it's not useful. And, in fact, while it was useful to get me through university and to be a scientist at a junior level, it's not a useful Um, It's certainly not a useful characteristic for a parent. (laughs) It doesn't lead to supportive and nurturing parenting. And similarly, it's not a great approach to supervision or leading a team, Um, depending on what field you're in. I'm really finding that to be able to let go of my desire for perfection has really helped me to nurture and develop the careers of the younger scientists that I'm now fortunate enough to be working in a supervisory capacity with. Sometimes I still bring my perfectionism, um, you know, to certain tasks, but not all the time. It's very interesting. What is revealed though, things get quite tense on board. Yes, there's emotion. Uh, Yes, there's joy, laughter, fun, but there's tension as over 70 women scientists tough-minded people, thinkers, uh, sceptics start to interrogate the leadership rhetoric that is being communicated to you, this focus on the self, this focus on cleaving open your own deficits, what you need to change as women in science in order to be better leaders. And what you all start asking about is, well, hang on a tick, though. It's not just about us. It's about systems. It's about the culture in science. It's about these bigger things. So just how did you all feel about, I don't want to give too much away because things get very tense on board and there's anger and frustration. And Fabian, your leader, 
uh, that who's kind of leading the charge here, your facilitator, really cops it big time. Um, how did you all feel about things getting tense on that first voyage? Fern? Well, Natasha, you've mentioned that that journey did have joy and courage and it had a lot of learnings. There were a lot of things that were very powerful and very wonderful and and although the film is very authentic, it can't hope to capture some of the, you know, joy of being experiencing Antarctica or the richness of the friendships and networks that we formed and the optimism, um, sense of possibility, you know, that we had instilled in us. You can't hope to capture all of those things. But it does also capture that there were challenges. There were serious challenges in that journey. I think it's worth noting that Homeward Bound 1, which I call it now because it was the first one, was a bit like a pilot program in a way. And we were the ones testing the pilot. <laughs> so we were there the were kicks. challenges. We knew we were the we guinea pigs. But I don't yeah. think we really Some knew that until we got on the ship. <laughs> Well, a lot of people didn't realise who were on the ship that, oh, right. okay. So once once that became apparent, and of course there were all kinds of tensions that then became evident. And again, I don't want to have any spoilers or anything, but, but there is one thing I'd really love to share, and that is that, you know, that one of the outcomes of how people responded to those ch many different kinds of challenges on the ship was that there was mm. loads and some very and dark loads. challenges, as people will say. Yes, absolutely, and very serious ones. That resulted in loads and loads and loads of feedback in a whole lot of different ways. And that feedback, um, although it might have initially been a shock for some of the people who were organising that, sorry, that program, <laughs> um, that feedback was heard. It was absolutely heard. And the program then evolved. And that's, there were a few of us who were participants on Homeward Bound 1 that said, we want to be involved and help reshape this program because we believe in the vision. So we worked and there were more than 60 changes in the program. And we made changes in the selection process, the content, the delivery and how it was done, risk management, evaluation, psychological safety, the faculty, a whole realm of different things. We made many, many, many changes. So the Homeward Bound that exists now is a substantially different and evolved beast. There are still many things in common. That's the, the joy and the central spine of what Homeward Bound does, the diagnostic tools that Sam's talked about, those things persist and are still part of Homeward Bound, but it is an evolved program. You know, and I had the privilege to be on the leadership faculty for Homeward Bound 3. And I can't tell you um, what an immense sense of joy and satisfaction I got from being part of that change and seeing that change and how it was actually quite exhilarating. It was an enormous sense of exhilaration and achievement. And now we can see and feel that Homeward Bound is actually achieving the vision that, home, that Fabian had when she had that dream, that there will be a thousand women with the will and the skills to be part of leadership in matters that affect the planet. That is happening. There are now over 400 women who've been through this. The network is astonishing and the way that network supports each other is extraordinary. And all sorts of things are coming out of it. Like Sam and I are part of a group that got a writing fellowship in Munich. We were at the Rachel Carson Centre together writing about how people respond to Antarctica and doing some multidisciplinary work. And we're continuing to work on manuscripts that have come out of that work. There were, I don't know, a dozen women from different cohorts were part of COP25 in Madrid, participating in things about what the are big our climate change gathering. Climate change. People are doing consequential, collaborative, constructive things. And I'm very proud of what it's done. And, you know, I, I think I often think of what kind of ancestors will we be? That That's one of the measures that I have around, you know, what kind of leadership do we want? And I really think that all of these women who are part of Homeward Bound um, are going to be tremendous ancestors for this planet. 
Fantastic. Song Chow And then for we you. are so grateful to you for doing all of that work of taking the program that we were part of, that we were the guinea pigs on, and helping to realise that vision. Yeah. Thank you for doing that work. I'm well, it, it, and it, it only well, that, happened the because of the of feedback. Fire. Yeah. The, the feedback the made that. If it had, yeah. If it had just been an okay program, people would have gone, yeah, okay, average, and moved away. But because it was a very <laughs> powerful and challenging experience, there was very powerful and challenging feedback. So things had to change in a substantial way. And they did and they have, and it's a much stronger program, of course, because of it. Wow. And people will see the transformations for everyone uh, in this film, The Leadership. Song Chow, for you, big things happened after this. Was it because of this this whole program? Mm. I, I would say, yeah, like I would also attribute a large part of what I do now to Homeward Bound. And as, as Fern was saying, explaining these feedbacks and the tensions we had on the ship, I think, um, you know, I was one of the youngest on the journey. And I think now if I go there again, as the me now who have actually gone through a lot more difficult time than when I was just on board and quite naive in in my current view, um, I, I wouldn't know if I would be able to, you know, stay neutral and stay grounded. But back then there was something that I saw that I felt like, you know, everyone want this program to be better because they all cared so much about women in leadership and women in science and all the feedbacks and the, the, the skepticism and the discussions that the anger are coming from. Okay. Why aren't we using this opportunity as a real? opportunity for change, right? Like we have such a powerful community and people all respected each other. So I think the intention behind that uh, tension is actually really powerful. And that's an intention for change, an intention to improve things, an intention to really take on this movement. So, And it's not just one person's dream, it's actually a collective movement. And all of us who are part of this journey and the next 600 who will join the movement, you know, we have the power and the agency to actually shape it and build it. And I think, I think that's a really big lesson I have learned. And I think during COVID, we have all experienced that in a small, isolated environment, how much emotions and tension could arise, right? And imagine that four years before we haven't experienced quarantine or lockdown, but essentially you're on lockdown on a ship and it is people working on the same goals. But even family members can have arguments when they all want the best of each other. So I think, you know, those were actually really healthy things that have happened. And I think it was really eye opening also because, you know, when Fabian and I had our first call, I think at the end of the call, she said, remember this moment because this is how global movements start. And I was having goosebumps. I was like, oh, my God, what is she talking about? And then I think (laughs) on the journey, (laughs) I realized um, global movement has its ups and downs. And, you know, it, it needs to allow things to grow. And I think, but I have realized that Antarctica is so powerful. A collective experience is so powerful. A community is so powerful. Um, that actually, um, I think without a very clear idea, I started an organization wanting to connect young people to nature, wanting to bring young people on these expeditions to have special experiences to connect with nature. And a lot of it is actually about designing a transformative experience. And we need to um, you know, get to people who may not have access to Homeward Bound, get to the scientists when they're young, get to the artists for nature when they're young, get to the change makers for nature when they're young, and also get these programs to um, audiences and young people in China. Because very much so, I think I would uh, appreciate it, experiences, opportunities like that as a, as a young person, but I didn't have access. So I would like to provide that for young people today. And also I have seen how a uh, transdisciplinary, um, how a, 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 a group, um, from, 
very from different background and from、uh, different parts of science could be really effective. And even you, you think we're all scientists on the ship, but we had a significant art project. We have all we have all of these science and art program. We had a well being program. We had yoga and workouts on board every day. We、yeah. had people who were walking on decks, and I remember from taking walks every day.、Um, On the ship, so I think you know we're very much interesting, complex beings, and you know in a lot of the program I run now, I collaborate with people、uh, with different stakeholders because we need everyone on board、um, yes. for you know the change for nature that we want to bring. And that's the energy and passion that you're pouring into Wildbound,、uh, the program that you run、uh, for young people and others, and a final. It's perhaps the most important question of all, in some ways. But a final comment from from you, Sam. You know, it's one thing to work on yourselves and your own leadership capacities, but what that has to spill into if we want more women in science and more women taking leadership roles in science,、uh, or 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 being enabled to get, take leadership roles in science, is for systemic and cultural change. And I wonder、yep. at the end of all this. What systemic and cultural change we must see in the next decade in the scientific disciplines to affect real change? Yeah, thanks for bringing that to the fore, Natasha. And I think、um, there was a lot of focus on the individual and our personal change within the first homeward bound. Journey, but certainly the work that has gone on since, and the collaborations、um, that Fern talked about with the 400 women who've been involved since, have really engaged more with that structural change. And I guess I feel confident to say now that the structural change that is required in the sciences is actually required in the whole of our society. So. The patriarchal system that we are all living in and have grown up in and are totally enmeshed in affects our day-to-day lives, the way we think about things, the way we interact with people, men and women, just as much. And women certainly、um, don't benefit from that, but men don't benefit from it either. A few men have benefited from it, and they've set up this.、Um, Patriarchal and also colonialist structure of the world,、um, but I think COVID is giving us a chance to pause and to pull back. And there's lots of people who are thinking. I think there was a some mention about intersexual intersectionality before. How all the、um, you know, as women in science, we might be focused on change within scientific organisations. Within academia, but actually, that same change is required in the whole of society. What happens in people's homes, the way they bring up their children, the way they how they interact with people on the street as they walk to work, totally influences how they are, how we are at work.、Um, and I hope that, well, I know that Homeward Bound has brought together people who are thinking about. The structural change required, so that women in science can be in more positions of influence, but also so that women of colour and women of、um, Indigenous women can be in those positions as well, because they're even less represented than. Well, look at the diversity on this call. It's probably、um, yeah representative、um, of, of the exact point that I'm making. So. Yeah, I think there's a lot more work to be done, and we're now in a better position to call it out and to find allies,、um, because white men are, need are our allies and need to be our allies to make change in this system, because they're in the positions、um, often of being able to make those changes.、Um, but I think even Even more, the majority is people from the global south, men and women, and transgender people,、um, recognizing our shared interests. I guess shared interests, shared experiences, shared passion, 
shared courage. That's definitely what this whole voyage was about. And I congratulate you on the film. And I thank you so much for joining us as part of the Myth Talks program. The Leadership is the documentary that you all star in. It is screening as part of Myth 68 and a Half, uh, the festival that continues until the <laughs> 23rd of August. You can find out more about The Leadership, directed by Ili Barre at myth.com.au. So let me thank Dr. Samantha Grover Fernhames, Song Chao Yao. Thank you so much for joining me and uh, may your adventures continue. I can't wait to see what you do in the world next. Thanks, Natasha. Thank you, Thanks Natasha. So much, Natasha.